So this is our lectionary Bible study, and we are on the second Sunday of the Epiphany. There was a slight change in the 2019 prayer book in just the wording for Epiphany. Uh, so instead of after Epiphany, it's of Epiphany. Um, other than that, I don't think there's really any changes. Um, they did tinker with some of the lessons, but not the Gospels. So by and large, the themes remain consistent. They just wanted to slightly up the sort of cohesive thematic cohesion of epiphany as a season. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things we talked about before. It's not, it's not as much a tight-knit season as like Lent or Advent or Christmas. It, in fact, in the, in the Roman um, three-year lectionary, uh, this is ordinary time. So once you get past the, the first Sunday, it's just ordinary time. So it's like Sunday number two or number one or something like that and their their scheme it just it goes sequentially and so you use some of them early in epiphany and then you pick up and you use the rest of them in the summer uh, depending on you know when Easter uh, falls it'll be a different number it rarely starts with one but... so let me see what what officially do they call it here it's second Sunday of the year and it just goes on third fourth and fifth um, but then when it gets into the, you know, after Pentecost, it's not, you know, the 14th Sunday of the year is not really the 14th Sunday of the year, I don't think. It, it'll be, anyway. Now, I can or deal maybe with it that is. white book there, Father. You can deal with the white book? Yeah, because... Because it's falling apart? It's because... No, no, it's sequential. And yeah. Instead of trying to figure out, you know, is it oh, the proper number? or uh, oh. love or all that stuff we have. The big change was Easter. So Easter, Easter used Easter. to be after Easter. Yeah. And then when they made it of Easter, Easter Sunday becomes the first Sunday of okay. Easter. So that throws the numbering off. Yeah, Whereas here, it doesn't really throw off the numbering because Epiphany is kind of different. Well, let's look at the collect. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that thy people, illumined by thy word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. So the first lesson used to be um, Isaiah 49, 1 through 7, in the 79 prayer book, which I think is the same as in the Roman Catholic original. Well, they use fewer verses, but it's the same section. Um, theirs is Isaiah 49, verse 3, and then 5 through 6. Uh, but here they decided to make a, a change all the way back up to Exodus. Um, so we'll see what connections thematically we might find. Oh, just to have an idea of where we're going, um, we're going toward John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God. And, uh, of course, it's Epiphany as the season, and the Collect uh, says that Jesus is the Savior, the light of the world, uh, illuminating um, the world with his uh, radiance of his divinity um, so that he may draw people to himself. And uh, Father Fuller had pointed out that um, the theme of Jesus' servanthood and its manifestation in his baptism is the th overarching theme of the readings for this Sunday. But this is Passover. This reading is Passover. Well, we'll see why they might have chosen it. Well, I guess the Lamb of God. Stay tuned, Steve yeah. Lamb. <laughs> exactly. So who is the Lamb of God that... John the Baptist was alluding to? Well, he's saying it's Jesus, but this comes from somewhere. Where does it come from? It comes from, not Isaiah, but Exodus 12. So Exodus 12, 21 through 28. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Select lambs for yourselves according to your families, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood which is in the basin. 
and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to slay the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to slay you. You shall observe this rite as an ordinance for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? You shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over all the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt, when he slew the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. So you're right, this is, you know, straight out of that uh, great old movie, The Ten Commandments. You know. <laughs> and uh, one thing I've always wondered about, I, I wish I just had an Orthodox rabbi sitting next to me so I could turn to him for answers about these things. But um, obviously today, uh, when Jews celebrate the Passover, they don't take blood and put it on their doorways and stuff, at least not that I know of. I don't know, I've never been to a Jewish Passover. But I wonder um, if that continued on at some point or if that was only that one night. Uh, obviously, the, the, the purpose of the blood was to say, don't kill anyone here, Passover. But I don't know if they continued to, to have some residue of the ritual of marking the doorway. I wonder if perhaps if there's like some little thing that's kind of a token of that when you slaughter the animal and you drain, of it, drain it of its blood, do you just like maybe, does the person doing it take one finger and mark something just sort of to kind of fulfill the obligation of the original ritual or something like that? There's little sort of kind of leftover ceremonies that are a part of a lot of uh, religious rituals. So I've always wondered about that. But it's, it's probably the kind of thing that's uh, lost to antiquity and um, we'll never really know until we get to ask some expert in heaven who's there. We'll ask Rabbi Google. Rabbi Google. <laughs> that going? Google's dying would actually provide blood. You know, hmm? Google's dying. Google's dying, yes. Followers. Rabbi Google's dying. Who would provide blood? Oh, Co so kosher butcher, first. really? I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, I wonder. If oh, you wonder? Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't During know. Passover, Jews don't put lamb blood on their doorposts. That was a one-time commandment. Okay. Well, there you go. Oh, and I wonder, I wonder what they do with the blood when they Most drain it from the, the animals. It, they buy their lamb already blooded. Well, I know. But I'm saying, what does the kosher butcher do? Like, is it supposed to Probably be poured out on the ground or something? Something like a placenta. A placenta. I wonder. Yeah. yeah. That kind of makes sense. But I know a lot of hunters that when they kill a deer and they're dressing it, go do this in respect. Hmm. Interesting. Nothing to do. Hello, Gregory. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. When he says, uh, take a bunch of hyssop, that's not like, you know, give me a bunch of paper towels. That's a, a, a branch of hyssop. And um, interestingly, of course, it was the same thing that Jesus on the cross, when he said, I thirst, they took a branch of hyssop and stuck the sponge on it and lifted it up. So that's always been the thing that the church fathers pointed out as a connection um, with the cross. When you wash your fingers, don't you mention hyssop in that prayer? Yeah, so that's, I forget what psalm it is, 32 or something, when you wash your hands. There's a psalm that you say that goes along with that. Um, hyssop also has been used um, like for sprinkling holy water and things like that. In any, there's no regulation in the church that it has to be hyssop. It can be any branch, you know. So sometimes we'll take used over palm stuff or something from Easter greenery or whatever is available. Um, also, one thing that we should keep in mind is that this is directed toward the Jewish people, of course. Um, you're supposed to mark your houses, and it says that uh, they followed the commandment. But the, 
what spared them was not being an Israelite, not being, you know, a son of Abraham, but it was following the commandment uh, to mark your house um, as a house of protection. So it could be, you know, that an, an Israelite house didn't comply, so they were slaughtered. An Egyptian household did comply, and they were spared. So it depended on the obedience rather than just the hereditary relationship. And in fact, it, it, Paul doesn't pick up on that example, but he makes that point uh, several times, that um, it, the true Jews, the true Israelites, are the ones who um, are uh, grafted into the tree and uh, follow the Lord in obedience and so on. Uh, let me see, anything else to point out? In verse 25, he says that this is a ritual that uh, you won't just do this one time, but you will keep on doing it. And it sounds like they don't do it in the wilderness, but they only do it when they get to the promised land, at least from that particular verse. When you come to the land, which the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. So there could be an interval, or it, might, it, it could also fit uh, if they get, you know, just did it every year in between. But it seems to imply there, as I'm reading it, that uh, they, they wouldn't uh, do it again until they got to their new homes. And then when they were in transit, it would be different. But I don't know. Uh, in verse 26, um, part of the ceremony is uh, educational. Um, so there's always supposed to be that element. What does this mean? And then you're supposed to explain. This is the sacrifice, the offering of the Lord's Passover. And it's a commemoration of an event that happened in time, but also a kind of event that transcends time and touches all time. Um, so, you know, modern Jews today will talk about, you know, the Lord has brought us out of captivity. So it's not just them back then, but it's also something that kind of transcends time and touches us today. And a lot of, especially in the ecumenical era, uh, a lot of Christian theologians point this out and say this idea of anamnesis, um, this memorial, is something that is not just uh, remembering something that happened back then, but kind of entering into uh, the mystery of redemption that uh, spans time and space. So when did, when did the instructions come back, come around to leave a chair for, you know, leave the door open for Elijah, that I don't know, and that could be something that's fairly recent in terms of the long-term perspective. Um, and, and we also should not make the assumption that, for example, all the Jewish rituals of today are pretty much the same as they were in Jesus' time. I wonder if that's There's been a lot of change and evolution. Yeah. Of course, the, all of those wise Jews that got together and formulated all the books and everything, that was way after Jesus. Yeah. And of course, the, the biggest shift in Judaism was from a, we might say, a sacrificial, sacramental, priesthood centered type of religion to more of a book centered, study centered, following the commandments type of religion. And in Jesus' day, they were, they were both there, but then when the temple disappeared, the priesthood became pretty much irrelevant, and it was all centered around the synagogue and around the book. Do they do uh, uh, Jews still stand up for the Passover? Stand up? Yeah. The, doesn't a commandment say you will stand up with your loins girded so you can eat in a hurry? Oh, you, oh. yeah. That does. They're getting ready. I don't think so. Get ready to run. Yeah. After the Passover. I mean, Google's dying again. Yeah, Google's dying. Well, no, what I want to know is. Um, I don't think so. I, in all the depictions I've seen of a modern day Seder, nobody was standing up. Oh, okay. And nobody was wearing robes that their loins were girded, where they pulled them up and tied them around the waist, yeah. you know, so they could run. I don't think. <laughs> that might have been a first time thing, too. That, that was just telling me, as soon as the Passover, as soon as you're passed over, get ready to run. But I think it's, it's you know, the, uh, the tangible remnant of that is the unleavened bread. So. That's why the bread is unleavened, because we don't have the time to wait around. Okay. 
Okay. Well, let's look at the psalm. Uh, this psalm, number 40, uh, its attribution says, For the choir director, a psalm of David. Uh, the, in my study Bible, the heading says, uh, Thanksgiving and a cry for help. Father Fuller says, It's a psalm of thanksgiving for deliverance from tribulation. Um, it's talking about offering the will of obedience uh, to God. So not just offering uh, material things, but more importantly, offering um, a humble, sincere uh, heart that is ready to follow God's will. So the, the sacrifice of the will um, is the primary thing that's involved here. Um, and it doesn't mean that you should give up the material offering. It just means that the material offering should be sincere and uh, what makes it worthy, what makes it uh, effective is that there's a self-offering that goes along with it. And that could relate, of course, to uh, the, in the Christian era, the offering of the Eucharist. Um, you know, it's no automatic sort of mechanical magic type of thing. It's a vehicle for us to join ourselves, the self-offering of our own selves, our hearts, our wills, our lives, to the self-offering of Christ on the cross, I, our Passover, I which is sacrificed. It really makes a big deal out of verse 2. Verse 2. It, that he brought me out of the clay and set my feet on the rock and ordered my, my uh, going, which is three mm -hmm. parts. So let's look at this. Is, this is a much longer psalm. It goes on to verse 17. We stop at verse 11. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my calling. He brought me, out, me also out of the horrible pit, out of the mire and clay, and set my feet upon the rock and ordered my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even a thanksgiving unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that hath set his hope in the Lord, and turn not unto the proud, and not unto such as go about, or, sorry, and turn not unto the proud, and to such as go about with lies. O Lord my God, great are, thy, are the wondrous works which thou hast done, like as to be also thy thoughts which are to usward. And yet there is no man that ordereth them unto thee. If I should declare them, and speak of them. They should be more than I am able to express. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sacrifice for sin thou hast not required. Then I said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me that I should fulfill thy will, O my God. I am content to do it. Yea, thy law is within. I have declared thy righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I will not refrain my lips, O Lord, and that thou knowest. Okay. On the... Uh, I have one. Yeah. Just for the, for the thinking of Sunday. This verse 10, the last line... I was wondering if there's something missing. It doesn't have... Yeah, it's, there's nothing after... Let me see. Uh, thy law is within my heart. Yeah, that's what it's supposed it's to be. Within my heart. I'll make sure that's right in the oh, bulletin. Oh, that's in the bulletin. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be, th these kinds are hard for the congregation and the choir when these, they have these com complex sentences that you think, okay, I'm at the end of the sentence, but there's another, there's another <laughs> part of the sentence coming up. <laughs> A big part. Big well, and you know, I'd, uh, you'll pr probably be scandalized to hear me say this, but I don't particularly care for the Coverdale Psalter. Um, uh, my other other colleagues of mine, especially the older ones, they grew up on the Twenty Eight Prayer Book and stuff. They just love the Coverdale Psalter, but for me, it's all tongue twisters. Listen, and to me, Coverdale, I didn't like Coverdale mm -hmm. because I was accustomed to King James. I grew up on King James. Yeah. And Coverdale was like foreign language, practically. Well, especially if it's something where it's kind of sunk in and you kind of yeah. know what to expect mm -hmm. and then it's something different. It's jarring. But it's close enough so it 
it sounds almost the same, but then you get that speed bump kind of effect. <laughs> and uh, uh, in fact, uh, on the drive back from visiting uh, Kansas City, I was listening to some history about the English Bible translations and stuff, and um, the Coverdale Psalter was one of the earliest ones, um, a part of um, Tyndall's first effort to make a comp comprehensive English Bible. I mean, there had been some even old English translations like the Lindisfarne Gospels um, were English Gospels, but they were like the old English that we can't read anymore. <laughs> or, well, people like us can't read anymore. Um, but this was the first real effort at making, you know, a cover-to-cover -cover translation. And um, Tyndall did the New Testament, and then he had to kind of start to farm out Old Testament stuff. And uh, Coverdale really didn't do Hebrew, so he just translated it from the Latin. Um, so that's also why it's a little bit different um, sounding to modern day translations that come from the Hebrew and are not filtered through the other language. First, probably because it's, I would imagine the Latin might be a translation of the Greek translation of the Hebrew. So it might be filtered a couple of times. I'm not quite sure. It's also interesting about, um, I kind of went off into some tangents kind of looking up stuff about the translations. And uh, we're familiar with the Vulgate from uh, St. Jerome. He, he wasn't the first one that made a Latin translation. What he did is went and revised the old Latin translation, the Vetus. I guess it's called the Vetus. That, no, that means new. Anyway, I don't know, w whatever it's called. But um, there were some places where they refused to use um, uh, Jerome's Vulgate. So they would use it for the readings, the selections in the Missal, but for the parts in the ordinary of the text that people were accustomed to, they didn't use um, his, old, his, his new Vulgate. So for like the Lord's Prayer, they kept the old translation. Um, and they, so it's, it's, it's a great parallel actually to modern day where even you, know, you have right to type congregations that don't want to use traditional anything and that they'll say, Our Father who art in heaven, which is so strange. Um, and the other thing is um, that I've noticed is, uh, O Lamb of God, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, have mercy yeah. upon us. Grant us thy peace, even in the modern. Itself. And I think a lot of. Catholics who speak English and use the rosary use the old form of the glory be. What is the old form of the The glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Mm -hmm. Is there a new one? Is there a new one? Well, like in the, you know, in the new prayer book, it's Holy Spirit and it's now and forever. Oh, um, okay. Well, the, I, the, the, what I, the one I do, which is Catholic, is uh, leaves off world without end it says, Amen, Alleluia. Hmm. That's weird. Yes? When, when uh, did we quit saying in the Lord's Prayer the part about deliver me from evil and from evil? It's not. It's. No, it's in there. <clears throat> I um, asked, what's the part that's not in there anymore? And when did we change it? Okay. I asked Father Allen this years ago because my mother in law made a comment about it. Oh, hon, we don't say that. Oh. Oh, yeah. For thine is the, thine kingdom, is the kingdom and power and glory. Two minutes later. Right, they yeah. do. But what Father Allen told me was we, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, said it like that for hundreds of years. And the other, the Protestants were the ones that cut it off and didn't say it. And and then they took it on. They were like, oh, okay, we need that ending. And then the Catholics said, well, we don't want to be like y'all. And so they cut um, it off. No, that's incorrect. So the short version, Deliver Us From Evil, Amen, mm -hmm. is the original. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's in the Bible. So for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. It's not technically in the Bible, the original, the Greek. Um, but it was customary sometimes to add a doxology. So like other prayers. You know, 
In fact, there's an Eastern form of the doxology for that. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and to the ages of ages. Um, but in the Mass and in the office, uh, it was deliver us from evil, amen. And then, and, and the priest, in, in the Mass, the priest would say it by himself, and everyone re would respond, but deliver us from evil. Mm -hmm. And then he would continue on with the embolism, deliver us from all evils, past, present, and to come, and so on. And then in the office, for whatever reason, they would say it silently or to themselves or whatever. So the leader would say, Our Father, and everyone else would, Lord, in the name of the Father. And then they would go back vocal again and deliver us from evil and stop there. The yeah, the requiem, yeah. Why? I don't know that. That, that seems the oddest thing because you would think, Well, the Lord's Prayer, that's the one thing kind of we all say together. I don't think anybody said it together liturgically until the 20th century. Well, I mean, I guess the, with the Reformation. Um, but also, so how, how does that get in? At the Reformation, um, there's this kind of uh, wholesale, you know, let's scrap the liturgy, let's come up with our own new thing, let's get back to the Bible, let's use the Bible. So by the time you get to an English Bible, um, you have the Textus Receptus. So it's Erasmus's pulling together of all the oldest fragments he can find and trying to have the best Greek text to work from. And at some point, a doxology had made its way into a copy where some pious copier probably had just added a customary you know, thing that you throw in. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. On. Somehow that you know, little, little praise on the side had entered its way into the main body of the text through copies and made of copies and so on. And we, we, we know about some of those other things. Um, so the Textus Receptus, from which they started to make translations, uh, had that in there. So that's why it's in the King James. But that's why it's not in all of the modern ones, because the modern ones, well, we know that that was an edition that crept in, and so they translate from the originals. And so the modern translations, like the RSV and the, all the others, it'll just be, deliver us from evil, amen. And then maybe a little note at the bottom saying, and some versions have, for thine is the kingdom and the power. Father, I thought at first you said Textus Protectus. No. <laughs> Textus Receptus, the received text. And then sometimes it's forever. And then it, forever it, was a, it was an ecumenical thing, I guess, with the new Mass in 1969, where after the embolism, then they threw in for the, a doxology, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Um, I don't know. And I don't know where and why the whole thing about standing came in. That's a total novelty. Standing during the prayer. Standing during the Lord's Prayer. Oh. Well, their order is so different. To me, their order is different enough that it wasn't... Um, you were already... I think, weren't you already standing? No, so everybody's kneeling. It's right after the consecration and everything. And then it's like, let's all stand up and hold hands and say the Our Father. Oh, God. And then let's all kneel back down again. Yeah. It's so odd. But anyway, we're back to the Bible. So let's look at the uh, epistle, which is from 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. Let me see if that's the same as the original. No, it's 1 through 3. Same area, but just a shorter version of it. So this is Paul, of course, introducing his letter to the Corinthians. We think that First and Second Corinthians might actually be a pat patchwork of a, more than two letters. Um, and I'm not an expert on this, but I think Second Corinthians might be two, two or three different letters pieced together. In any case, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I give thanks to God always for you because of the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him with all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony to Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to add an amen there. Yes. <laughs> Interestingly, this is one of those with you know very long sentences, so... Um, Yeah, so 1 through 3, it, no, 1 through, yeah, the end of 3 is, is the first sentence, and then 4 through the end of 8 is the second sentence. So this is a, this is a, this is a three sentence reading. Well, this is one of those things, I'm not sure about the Greek um, and the punctuation. Do, you know, do the Greek texts have punctuation? I know the Hebrew doesn't. And that might be the same thing with ancient Greek, is that it doesn't really have any punctuation like we have. But this is all stuff that came in later, so I'm curious. There's some of these commas that could be periods. <laughs> well, and, and you can see from different you know English translations, it's considered at the will of the translator as to how they want to punctuate it, how they think it works best. And of course there's kind of an ebb and flow in terms of like the, the frequency you see of commas and the use of semicolons and things like that. It's almost like a fad. Modern day will have fewer commas and older stuff will have more commas. See, the only thing I would point out that came to my attention was in verse 2, he uses called to be saints. And of course, as you know, as the letter goes on, he's going to deal with a lot of problems, a lot of troubles. And I think that's the overall thing that he's getting at, is, is reminding them of their calling. And they're supposed to conform their lives to Christ. So it's time to let's all humble ourselves and um, do some self-examination and make amends and... Um, get right with each other and get right with God and, and pursue that calling to be holy ones. Is this colon at the end of the second verse correct? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I guess. I mean, what I mean is, 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 is this a typo in, in typing it up or is that in the Bible? I, don't, I mean... It's, it's probably in the RSV. I don't have that in front of me. Sorry, I, in, in the uh, whatever I've got, whatever I have, whatever I have here, I don't know what this is called. It, it just struck me because I Christian Standard Bible, it's different. So at the end of verse 2, there's a period. But there's a dash. Oh, period and a dash. Um, between, well, it says, With all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, dash both their Lord and ours, period. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so much of this is style in terms of the modern day translation. A theological thing he hits on uh, in this letter is this um, kind of balance and tension between the local church and the universal church. So Father Fuller in his notes says, the most striking feature in this heading is Paul's emphasis on the universality of the church. There can be only one people of God, and each congregation is nothing by itself, but only a manifestation of that one people in a local embodiment. So he says that they are a part of the Church of God, which is at Corinth. 
So the local church um, can be congregational in the sense that it realizes the supreme dignity of its vocation to be the representative and the embodiment of the universal church in that local place. Uh, I would think it's in the RSV. Well, it's the kind of thing where, like, um, modern day, you might be tended to rather use a dash or a period. Yeah, a period would work. So. Well, let's look at the Gospel from John, chapter 1. It's kind of... I guess a little bit odd that we switch over to John uh, because year A is Matthew. Um, but, you know, there's some exceptions every now and then, especially if you've got a, you know, a feast day or something and you need something from one of those other Gospels to make it match whatever the occasion is. But uh, here it's just kind of a regular, ordinary time type of Sunday. Um, but they decided to hit upon uh, the, the Lamb of God and perhaps that's just... They couldn't find a, a good match in Matthew's version, so they decided to use John. So John 1, 29 through 42. The next day, well, let's back up. The next day after what? Okay, so uh, right before we get to verse 29, uh, John was out in the wilderness uh, bearing testimony um, and uh, so after the prologue ends, it begins with verse 19. This was John's testimony. Um, and then they, the people from Jerusalem say, we don't understand you. Who are you? Are you a prophet? Or, you know, what are you? He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Um, I baptize with you with water, but someone stands among you. You don't know him. He's the one who's coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. And then, so, the next day after that, after John had kind of hinted that the Messiah might be in the area. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him, and this time he points him out. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. I myself did not know him. But for this I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, again, John was standing with the two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. <coughs> I wonder what the next verse is. Oh, interestingly, the next verse and he brought Simon to Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. It's kind of strange that they dropped it off at that particular There's verse. A lot of drama here. Are y'all, is anybody watching The Chosen? The, no. Uh, the series? That's on my list of things to watch, but... Well, I'll tell I you that I, I watched the first couple of episodes of season one. And then somewhere, maybe see, maybe episode three, and I stopped watching it. 
for probably six months. And then I went back and I watched one and two again and mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I'm just going to keep going. And I'm totally hooked. Totally. It is so beautiful and well done, but there are things in it that I wouldn't mind a priest <laughs> saying, yeah, maybe like, like they just like John and Jesus know each other really well. They are cousins and they are close. Are you talking about in the chosen? In the chosen. Okay. Yes. And so when it says I myself did not know him, was that because did they re meet? I don't remember the well, baptism. Aren't they cousins? Yes, yes, they are. Well, why wouldn't they know each That's other? That's what I. And they lived far apart. Yeah, they. Yeah. Yeah, but. Okay. But did they? I would have to go back and watch an earlier episode, like of the baptism, to see mm -hmm. if maybe they re met or something. I wasn't paying enough attention. But it's very. I thought it wasn't well done at the first when I was first watching. It's very well done. Mm -hmm. And everybody in it is just a real human being. I know some big fans, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's good at kind of taking the familiar and making it feel, I guess you'd say, real or, mm -hmm. you know, yes, kind of breaking joke. through that mystique. You know, Jesus laughs and jokes, and, mm -hmm. and the, the, they, the other guys, they fight and argue with each other, and Matthew is sort of autistic and... And, and, and John always has his book, and he's always writing everything down. Hmm. And Matthew, too. But it, it's just a, I really... On what like, the, yeah. platform is it? Prime. Oh, we get Prime. I would not have There's also an app that you can get just yeah, for that. you can watch it on your phone or, or yeah. on your iPad. But six months ago, I would not have recommended it. But now, I really, mm -hmm. highly Good. recommend it. Yeah, it's one of those we want to catch up on. Have you been watching it? I've seen it quite, yeah, I watched it. the movie. And all. When he says, um, you know, I did not know him, and we get that twice here, verse 31 and then verse 33, I myself did not know him. I don't think that's, you know, I didn't know he was my cousin or I didn't know his name was Jesus. I think it's, I didn't, I didn't know that he was the anointed one. Yeah, because the context is, I didn't know that, but I was told okay. to look for the one mm -hmm. that you see the Spirit descend upon, yeah. and He's the one. And so that, that comes to be the importance and the relevance of His testimony here, that you know I have discovered for myself, and now I'm sharing the good news, bearing witness of this identity. That, that, that makes sense because, they, as I said, they're cousins, and mm -hmm. I didn't know my cousin. And he, John is portrayed, I mean, they all kind of laugh about, about who John is. Because, you know, some of the disciples... John the Baptist? Of, yeah. Okay. Some of the apostles were followers of John. Mm -hmm. And now they, like John said, now you go, no, he's the one you follow. Mm -hmm. and, and so, it's just good. It's just good. You need to yeah. watch it. Did they say in it, I must diminish? But how did they? John tells his disciples, I must diminish. You know, I'm not I don't know if, if that scene was played out like that. But Well, where along in the spectrum of the history of the gospel story are they now? For me? Or oh, are, are you caught up to the most recent episode or are you earlier on? I'm in season two, episode six. And I think season three started last okay. November, September, October, somewhere in there. So no, I haven't finished season two yet. But um, he just healed the guy at the pool of Bethesda, which, again, a priest or someone would be helpful because they portray him as being the brother of Simon the Zealot. And so that's how Simon the Zealot came to Jesus, is because he, his brother was healed. How long are the, are the sections? About, you? An hour, about an hour, 45 minutes. To so minute. you, you can't just binge all night long. You probably have to do a couple. Well, uh, Some people do that. Yeah. 
You could do one. I mean, if I I don't watch it every night, but I usually watch two episodes on the nights that I do watch it. So. The reading that we have is about twice the length of the original. So the original stops at the end of verse 34, and then 35 says the next day, and then he, John points out to two of his disciples, um, behold the Lamb of God. And uh, so we kind of, we have two parallel um, scenes here, but they're back to back two different days. So John first bears witness to the identity of Jesus in general, and then he bears witness more individually to two of his followers and say, y'all ought to start hanging around him. And I'm a little unclear about exactly how this unfolds at the end. Um, one of those who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon. And I guess that means maybe because they want to go home with Jesus and talk with him further, you know, where are you staying? Come and see. So I'm guessing maybe from seeing him out at the river to seeing him at the house, at some point there, that's when he goes and finds Peter and says, come with me, i got to show you this guy. And Peter is, uh, Simon is very cynical in the show. Oh, is mm -hmm. it? And so Andrew comes in, and he's also the only one that is portrayed as married. But, and so Simon comes into the house, and he's like, you know, and he's like, Andrew comes into the house, and Simon's like, you know what? If you're listening to John, forget it. Because they all know John, mm -hmm. John the Baptist. Anyway, like I said, watch it. But, but, um, the guy that was preaching Sunday, it was it had just it seemed the cotton patch gospel in Atlanta on the stage and at the baptism of Jesus he's up on a 12 14 foot step ladder and you can't see him and he booms out in this really out of the darkness and you can spots on him and he says something like yo this is the son of God <laughs> <laughs> and there's a spot on Jesus. He says, it is really effective. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see, what else to point out? Mm -hmm. Especially... He and James are not brothers. Sorry. That's okay. You go can ahead. finish. No, oh. go ahead. But it seems to me, especially with the kind of two back-to-back -back days here, um, that there's kind of a dual purpose to John's baptism. So, of course, the more obvious one is to call people out to repentance and a new beginning, uh, wash yourself. And this is also the, the mikvah of baptism is the initiation ritual for a convert. So it's like we're going to start over completely, treat ourselves as converts and wash our sins away. But then the other one is this whole, uh, it's like searching for the Messiah. You know, it's like a filtering through the masses. Um, we'll find the, the, sp the speck of gold while we're panning in the, in the river here, um, whenever the Holy Spirit will point him out. Mm. So there's kind of like two parallel purposes of the whole baptism that's going on. And it continues on baptizing even after Jesus is um, identified and, um, and John the Baptist, of course, later is arrested and then beheaded. And he, his following continues on for some time. I don't know how many years, but um, he had some just diehard, loyal followers that tried to keep up the movement as much as possible, but it just gradually petered out over time. Some of them, of course, departed to follow the, the Christian movement. Some of them just kind of tried to hold down the fort on their own. Did Jesus know he was the Son of God before he was baptized? Yes. There's kind of a revisionist uh, the, 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 approach. The, say again? There's kind of a revisionist approach that says he, he didn't know who he was, but the orthodox view of Jesus and his identity was he, he was aware. Yeah. Say again? When he was 12, 
he went to the temple and he called at his okay. father's okay. house. Okay, all right. All right. That, then that's really easy to say. Mm-hmm. Didn't you know what I did with my cows and my father's house? Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, there's you know plenty of sort of unanswered questions and really I would say unanswerable questions about the kenosis, the self-emptying, the humbling, the becoming human, and yet being fully divine, and how does that work, you know. Um, so sometimes it goes to the opposite extreme, and you find in the non-canonical Gospels some ridiculous things, like the, the baby Jesus standing up in the crib and lecturing people and yeah, the, that kind of thing, you know. Childhood stories, yeah. the histories that are just like fairy tales. Yeah. 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 Can you see Joseph? Jesus, can't you saw on a straight line? <laughs> you know, Joseph, if he was a carpenter, Joseph had to teach him. Or is it that, you know, Jesus does everything absolutely perfectly and he's like, how in the world does this <laughs> little bitty kid do this thing? You know, that's the one, uh, I've read a lot of Bill O'Reilly books. I can't read Killing Jesus. I have it, but I just can't get myself to. to read it. But, um, one of the things that he says is that Jesus was not a carpenter. He was a stone cutter. Because, there, as he says, there was no wood. You had to, it, everything was made out of stone. And I'm like, no. I don't really think so. And it's, it's probably like he was a furniture maker yeah, and that sort of that thing. Day, Repair man. In that day, Palestine was fertile and had woods. It was only after the Jews left and it sort of turned into a desert place. Yeah. And he's also up... Arabs cut down all the trees. He, he's up a, a, a little yeah. north where it's greener and woodier. And and there's also, I forget the name of the town, but Nazareth is not quite a suburb, but very close to a, a major center of commerce where you could, you know, find anything in the world kind of thing. So they had access to a lot of materials and equipment and industry and so on, even though they were in the little town. Well, that's it. I don't know what else to point out. <laughs>